so Tina, let's start with, uh, tell me where you grew up and what did you want to be when you grew up? I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And when I was three years old, we moved to Iran. And so I was this little uh, American girl. In fact, it's kind of a funny story because I thought of myself as American. Both, both of my parents are Iranian. And I was in my preschool and the queen of Iran showed up and she said, oh, what a cute little Iranian girl you are. And I said, I'm not Iranian. And she said, what? I said, well, my parents are Iranian, but I'm American. So, <laughs> um, I don't know how well that went over, but when I came home and told my parents at night, they didn't think that was the best story, best thing to say to the queen. Um, but so I lived in Iran for four years. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a pivotal time in my life. Um, and then the revolution started when I was seven. Oh. And so we came back to came back to St. Louis. And I would, you know, live in St. Louis until I went away to college. So that's that's unusual that you would start in the United States, go to Iran, and then yeah. come back to the United States. Do you remember um when you came back, did you still feel American or did you feel Iranian or did you feel some hybrid? Like what was that adjustment coming back at seven years old? The answer to this question would only emerge after years and years of introspection, a little therapy, um, because <laughs> that was, you know, being in Iran and, uh, you know, I was... I spoke English in an international school. And after three months, I learned to speak Farsi fluently. And my father was head of two engineering firms. Um, and then I come back to St. Louis, Missouri. It was, it was a foreign place. I remember being asked if we um, rode camels to school. Um, it was right around when the hostage crisis was um, was starting. And so uh, there would be jokes about Khomeini being your husband and and people pointing guns, fake guns at you. So it was this, you know, coming from Iran, which is this beautiful country with such a rich heritage and being so proud of the family I come from and the country I come from and come to St. Louis where suddenly there's not just a lack of understanding, but also a disdain for this background. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't realize until I was an adult, the impact that would have on me and my desire to make sure that no one ever has to feel like an other. Um. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's interesting because as I was researching and preparing for this conversation, I saw that you were very, very focused on diversity and inclusion. And now I understand why. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's about, it's about inclusion and, you know, you, you see, so since I moved into this role, we've done, um, for one thing, just speaking pu publicly, right? Speaking every time I get up and talking about the importance of inclusion and being heard and, and actually being seen, right? Being seen. It is remarkable to see how, how much more effectively people can show up and when you create space for them to show up as their authentic mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. uh, it it can be transformative to a culture, can be transformative to um, helping people feel rewarded in their job. And um, yeah, it's mm. it, it's uh, it's mm. important. It's really important. Okay, so let's let's talk about your childhood a little bit more and then we'll fast forward to what you're doing today, which is what did you want to be when you grew up? Did you want to be an engineer? Did you want to be a doctor? What did you want to be? Yeah, so um, I grew up uh, actually going to Baptist church okay. three or four times a week. 
And um, so there were periods in my life that I wanted to be a missionary. Okay. Um, but from a very young time, people would uh, say, oh, Tina's going to be a lawyer. Tina's going to be a lawyer. And there's a certain point in time where you start believing what people tell you. So um, I went from missionary to wanting to be a lawyer, um, to wanting to be a professor. And um, actually, it's it's interesting how path leads to path leads to path, right? Because um, so I graduated from college wanting to be a lawyer and I got into um, I got into Wash U Law School. And there must have been a voice in my head that was saying, you don't really want to be a lawyer. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So I told my parents I'd like to put off um, law school for a year. And while I put off law school, I went to San Diego and I got a job in marketing. And so I took my first job and I learned a lot about what I liked and what I didn't like. I learned about what I was good and what I wasn't good at. And that led to the next thing. And then there were learnings there that led to the next thing. So it wasn't this straight line path, but this circuitous path of curiosity and learning more about myself and having grace to understand you don't, you don't have all the answers out of the gate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That led to where I am today. Which let's talk about. So currently you are the CEO Tell us what, tell us, first of all, what GXX does, GHX does. Yeah. So GHX is a global healthcare supply chain platform. Mm -hmm. And what that means is if you're in a hospital getting care, it is very likely that GHX data has been used to make decisions on the best product for the right patient at the right time. Mm. And so, you know, before, before COVID, nobody really understood what the healthcare supply chain meant. Mm -hmm. But during COVID, we saw both, both the health impact as well as the financial impact of a healthcare uh, supply chain in crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I, I want to see if I can draw some threads and maybe help me connect some dots. So we recently actually had on the podcast, um, Rob Allen, who's the CEO of Intermountain Health. And he shared a couple of data points, which I thought were really interesting. And I I'd love for you to either connect to those data points, how, how GHX might help make those happen. And if it's not connected, then I'd be fascinated to hear a couple of data points that suggest like the efficacy of your work. So here are three things that he shared. Number one is that they have plans in place to increase nurses time by the bedside from 36% to 41% of the time versus the national average of 30%. He has doctors. um, They started providing ambient documentation. So turn on the phone, patient visits. When they finish the visit, the charting's done, saving the doctors two hours a day. And then they also have a tool embedded in the electronic health records that allows them to manage their mailbox using AI. So they can look at the email, patient's information, draft the response, and then save you know 50% of their time responding to email. So these operational improvements that are making it easier for the, the doctors to, to, to and the nurses and the caregivers to do their work. So I'm curious, you know, because our listeners will have heard that podcast, are there tie-ins here or are there different data points and different pieces of that puzzle that make everything work? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So what Rob was probably speaking to is removing these operational uh, tasks, removing the friction so that clinicians can operate at the top of their license. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the healthcare supply chain today is there's friction, there's complexity. And so what the GHX platform allows, it brings together the data and the technology to make for a seamless supply chain. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting that maybe he nestled under one of those three things, Intermountain is actually very innovative in terms of how they use clinical outcome data 
to improve patient outcomes. They've been talking about this in an innovative way for 20 years. And so that data that uh, health systems use that look at different patient cohorts horts, and looks at the efficacy of um, this heart valve versus another heart valve so that health systems can make decisions of the best product, right? The best heart valve with the best outcomes at the best price, which, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about value-based care, or if you call it Obamacare, it is about the best outcomes at the best price. So GHX's data solutions give health systems the data to balance both the outcomes and the cost. Oh, okay. So give now, okay. Now I, I love how you tied that together, putting all those pieces together in our brains. Now give us an example of one or two case studies where you're like, oh, we are so excited because of our platform, because of our data, we were able to improve this outcome. Give us yeah. a couple of examples. Yeah. So one uh, was interesting, I don't know, a few a few years ago, we often bring in heads of supply chain to speak to GHX, um, to our, our uh, employees. And he shared that because of GHX solutions, because of the complexity we were able to reduce, he was able to hire 15 more nurses. Wow. There's a, that's 15 more clinicians that are able to deliver care on the front line. So it was incredibly, oh. incredibly rewarding to be able to see that um, the health system be able to make that that mm. investment. Mm. So your primary customers then are operations people within hospitals? It's supply chain people within okay. health systems, but also we're a two-sided network. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have about 80, 90% of the um, suppliers that yeah. are that operate on our platform mm -hmm. in the US. In fact, we were founded by leading um, suppliers like GE, Johnson & Johnson, Baxter, mm -hmm. Abbott, and Medtronic. Oh, interesting. Okay, so let's, um, now that we have that context and I, I wanna go back on your career for a minute, you started in sales and um, I, I found myself recently really curious about selling. And um, when you think of, because it's one of those things that people think you're either good at it, you're not. And I think we know that that's not necessarily true. Like there's a, there can be some talent, but there's some real skill involved. And so um, as for someone who's listening like me, who is thinking, you know, I want to be better at selling and being able to have people want to be able to buy what it is I'm offering. Um, what are some things that you learned along the way that would be helpful for people to know? The answer is not, uh, people often assume that a, an effective salesperson is, um, is an extrovert and um, they're, I hate the term, coin operated or they're um, just charismatic and can carry a room. And, and, and I don't think those are the most effective salespeople I've seen are people that are able to truly take time to understand understand their customers, understand what motivates them, to be able to show empathy in a way that allows for real connection. Mm -hmm. um, and some people, there are some sales reps that um, I would call it a lazy approach. They kind of mm -hmm. come in, they ask a few discovery questions, they think they know you, um, and they're really focused on the products that they sell. True, successful commercial people can come in and understand everything about like what are the things that are keeping you up at night? What are the things that make you more effective in your role? What are the things that that are um, that are friction in your ability to do the role? And then and only then after having that deep and profound understanding of your world, do we earn the right to talk about our solutions. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, hmm. true, true sales is about deep thought leadership. Hmm. And, and what ends up happening with that thought leadership is there's this this mutual respect that is bred. In fact, from my early days in Boston and New York, when I was a sales rep, those relationships have prevailed for 24 years. Wow. Because they weren't transactional sales relationships. They ended up being certainly mutual respect, but I learned as much from them as they did from me. And, and, and I earned the right to be able to you know, sell that next solution. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is beautiful. Deep thought leadership. Oh yeah. Mic yeah. drop moment, Tina. <laughs> All right. So you did sales today. You're the CEO. Just walk us. How long have you been at GHX? 24 years? I've been at 24 years, which was just months after we opened our doors. So yeah. walk us through some of the different, like just the trajectory to be where you are today. Yeah. Um, so started out in sales, which by the way, I do recommend a lot of people that are starting a, um, a career in business. I think sales and understanding that com uh, customer empathy is a, is a really good foundation. So mm -hmm. I started out in sales and then I moved into marketing. Um, from there, I moved into strategy. And so I was able to use my selling background, my marketing background, my deep customer empathy to, to move into a strategy role. And that's where I really learned the function, both the art and the science of strategy. And um, then it, it's actually a very interesting story, Whitney. I was Tell it. I want to hear it. <laughs> marketing role. And um Someone came into a meeting and said, Bruce wants to talk to you. Bruce was our CEO. So walk down the hall and I go into his office and he's sitting, I remember it like it's yesterday. He's sitting there and the head of HR is sitting there by him. And they say, we would like you to move your family to Europe and serve as president of our European business. Hmm. And I'm interested. And the head of HR starts whiteboarding what the org structure is going to look like. And she literally wrote Tina president. And then she wrote the people that would be reporting to me. And I'm fascinated by all of this and really excited. And so they're done talking for 15 minutes. And then I said, great. Now who's going to be leading Europe? And they looked at me like, well, were you here? the last 15 minutes, you're going to be leading Europe. But it didn't occur to me huh. that they were asking me to be the person. Now, if they had called me in and said, Tina, you are going to be the right hand person to the person and you are going to be responsible for making sure that that person is successful, I would have been incredibly confident that I am the best person for the job and that no one could support this person better, both commercially and operationally and strategically. I just hadn't ever seen myself in that role. Wow. How many years ago was this? 2012. So it was 12 years ago. So not that long ago that long ago no so you literally had not envisioned yourself in that leadership role even to the point when they're like you just got the part you are the leading actress in the film you're like no wait no no I'm not so who am I supporting right wow and this is you know I believe that true great introspection is also riddled with contradiction. Mm. Because in the one hand, I was incredibly confident. Mm -hmm. I knew I was exceptional in any task that I took on. And yet I saw myself in a certain weight class, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I saw myself as the understudy, not the lead. 
And I think you'd miss the point if you looked at it and said, oh, she didn't have the confidence. It was more a, other people saw it in me before I did. And this isn't an excuse. But I didn't see, there weren't other leaders out there as role models, especially in healthcare, especially in technology. And so while it's not an excuse, it's not like there was a sea of role models that I saw and could, um, period. There just yeah. weren't role yeah, the, the, models. I, I can see that. Yeah. I can be it. It just didn't occur to you. So I'm wondering, Tina, in order to be able to see yourself in that role, how did you have to disrupt yourself? How did you have to disrupt your mindset in order to, so to your point, you had the confidence that you could do it, but there still had to be some adjustments that you made mentally and emotionally to step into that. Do you remember what some of those were? You know, um, to be ready when opportunity strikes, is a lifetime of building muscles. And whether I was overtly preparing for that moment or not, having a deep and profound growth mindset was part of my journey from day one. Mm. In fact, I never even, like, I never had this aspiration to be the smartest person in the room. In fact, I'm not even comfortable. I'm more comfortable in a room where there's so many voices that I can learn from. Hmm. And I never begrudged the fact that I didn't have all the answers. I always focused on the importance of like knowing the right questions to ask, right? And that's a, that's a competency that comes through sales. Hmm. So it was about knowing the right questions to ask, not worrying that I had all the answers. So the first muscle that I built was around having a true and profound growth mindset. Did you have it going into that or you yes. had to strengthen it, but you just had to strengthen I, it further? I, well, I, yes, I, I had it. This, mm -hmm. this had been in my nature, this desire to learn um, had, had always